My name is Murray Gordon, and we live six months in the desert here in Rancho La Quinta, and six months in the Bay Area in San Francisco. I was born in uh, Lithuania in 1926. Town. The town, I, I was born in a town of Klaipeda, which is a sea, sort of, a, a, a sea resort. And then when I was six years old, we moved to Kaunas, which was the, the capital of Lithuania. K-A-U-N-A-S. The Jews used to call it Kovna. So uh, we moved to, the, because my mother wanted to be closer to her parents. And uh, so we moved to, to Kovna or Kaunas. <clears throat> and I was in Kaunas. <clears throat> Actually, uh, my first couple of years, they put me in a Jewish, in a religious uh, grammar school. It was called Yavne. And uh, after about six months, I was kind of getting bored with the teacher. And I started talking something that he didn't like. So I interrupted the class. So he called me over, lifted me up on my ears, and there's blood there, so my parents took me out of that school and put me in another school, a regular school, which was not a religious school. Was so, uh, and then I went to a gymnasium. It's called Real Gymnasium, which is a a high school in in Kovno, and uh, it was I was pretty active in this in school. I mean. I spoke perfect Lithuanian because I have a good ear for music and for language. I pick it up real good and accent good. So uh, one of the teachers who was Jewish, he was a colonel in the First World War, he took a liking to me and more or less he worked with me and developed my, my Lithuanian speech. And later on that that thing saved my life. Uh, that's uh, so. I was in school. I was uh, very active in music, languages, and math. Math was my favorite. I also in, in sports. I was involved in basketball and in soccer. We called it uh, football. Actually, we called it and ping pong. And of course, things were going on pretty good <clears throat> until <clears throat> the Soviets moved into Lithuania in 1940, 1939. And of course, it was a different thing because they took a lot of the wealthier people and they resettled them. And uh, they started teaching us Marx and Lenin and uh, they were against religion and tried to brainwash us that the Soviet system is better than any, any other system. And we had to study Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, who were the beginner, I mean, the, uh, the founders of socialism. And when Karl Marx had said, religion is the opiate of the masses. So that's why religion was forbidden in all the countries that they communists had occupied, because they didn't believe in it. <laughs> uh, so from 39, they, they, as the Russians came in, after a while, you know, was, people was excited, didn't know what to do, what's going to happen, I mean. And, but then after it settled down, they uh, we started going to school. The, the whole ch curriculum has changed. You know, we had to learn about Karl Marx and all the socialism, but a lot of the Soviet uh, heroes, and of course Stalin and Lenin, and uh, we, we learned all those things. And uh, what, there was more on a cultural level because we started having chess matches, <clears throat> and we used to go on, on outdoors, I mean on, on outings, and uh, we used to listen to a lot of propaganda in the Soviets. So things settled until <clears throat> the uh, Russians and the Germans <coughs> signed a non-aggression pact. And about a few weeks later, the Germans moved into Lithuania. 
And uh, of course, uh, the Jews were all very upset because they knew that the Germans are not friendly, that a lot of the Jews were harassed and sent to concentration camps from Germany and other countries they had occupied. So they started doing it in, in Lithuania. <clears throat> And the Lithuanian nationalist <coughs> sided with the, with the Nazis because they were against communism. <coughs> and they felt that the Jews were sympathetic to communism, which was not real. And I was walking the third or the fourth day that the Germans moved in. I was walking on the street to visit my grandparents. And uh, there was four of the Lithuanian nationals walking in front of me, and they turned around and they saw me. And they said, what are you doing here? And I think that I was a Jew. And my Lithuanian- you were a Jew. Yeah, my Lithuanian was perfect. So I said, I'm going to see a friend because we're having a meeting here and uh, we're just gonna discuss uh, some kind of things. So seeing that I spoke he said, be careful because there's Jews shooting at Germans and Lithuanian nationals through the windows. And I know Jews didn't have any guns. And he let me go. And uh, then, of course, the Germans, after a while, they made it tougher. And they took all the Jews and they gathered them. They had to move from their houses where they lived to a ghetto. And the ghetto was a place called Slabotke in Yiddish or Viljampoli in Lithuanian. And that was the Kovno ghetto. And we moved there and then... How do you spell that? The ghetto? Yeah, the name of the ghetto. Oh, it's in, in Yiddish it's Slabotke, S-L-A-B-O-D-K-E. Okay. And in, uh, in Lithuanian it's Viljampoli, W-L-W-I-L I A M P O L E. Okay, now that uh, uh, Lithuania had a lot of very famous rabbis. In in as an athlete, also they moved to the ghetto and they were persecuted, and. Uh, they, I remember after being settled in a ghetto for a couple of weeks, they took all the inhabitants of the ghetto and came to a big uh, piece of land, kind of a, pl a plaza, which was next to a hospital. That hospital <clears throat> had 80 patients, and there were doctors and nurses. <clears throat> As we were talking, listening to the Germans, we saw a fire go up. The whole hospital was burned. And then we found out that they burned the patients, the doctors, everybody, all the Jewish. And also at that time, they took away my grandparents and one of my Did uncles. your father's family? Not my mother's. My father's family was in a country. <clears throat> oh. This is... <clears throat> only my mother's family. So they took away my grandparents and one of my uncles and his wife and his ch children. So, uh, we, and they said they're being resettled to another area. And uh, though we didn't believe that, we knew uh, about uh, in, in Kovno or Kaunas, they had a place called the Ninth Fort, which was a, uh, a fortification during the First World War, the Russian fortification. And they took a lot of them there and they shot them. When we went to Lithuania after the war, after Janet and I, we found out that 80,000 Jews were killed in that fort. It was, yeah, so. So anyway, going back to the ghetto, uh, I wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, about go ahead. the uh, language spoken. You spoke Lithuanian. Perfect. Where, where, where most of the Jew, Jewish people... Did they, they spoke Lithuanian. Yiddish? They spoke Yiddish, but Lithuanian with a very heavy accent. A lot of them spoke a broken Polish. But being that 
I have a good musical ear, so I picked up the accent, I mean, the German, Russian, Lithuanian, Hebrew, Yiddish, while I was there. So at home, you, uh, were, you spoke Lithuanian? I spoke, at family, home we spoke family. Yiddish, but in school we spoke Lithuanian, and uh, then of course we had to learn Russian, so, but, uh, okay. so, so, where was it? Oh, so, and you know, they used to, while we were in a ghetto, this guy disappeared, this guy disappeared. I know they used to pick up, the Germans used to pick up Jews and... Did you have to wear a star at that time? Yes, we had to wear a star, David, and... Did uh, so you have to, have to wear it in a certain part of your body? Yes, on the front right here, by the heart. I noticed some people showed pictures to me where the star was on their back. Uh, no. Like over the right shoulder. No, right, right in front. In, in, yeah, where we are. And uh, things were getting pretty bad. And uh, then they had something called the big action. They took, they had to take a bunch of the population and they transported them to the 8th Fort. I mean, that was yeah. the 9th Fort. And I got kind of talking with a lot of my friends and they said, you know, there's an underground which is in a forest like 40 to 60 miles outside of the ghetto and uh, we're going to go, we're going to try to escape. Now, I was still a young kid and uh, I got involved in their organization and then they left and sent somebody and one night I was smuggled through the gate and took me to the forest, actually was in a, in a wagon with hay and all kinds of So they took me there and uh, most of them, the majority of, of the were Russian uh, soldiers who were not captured and the, the Soviets wouldn't let them back in. They said, you go fight. So uh, as I got there, you know, but finally we got uh, used to their area. And uh, I went to one, over to one of the guys, in ch not in charge, but uh, he's a, a macher, like they say. And I says, can I have a gun? He says, no, we, we don't have that many guns. If you want a gun, go take it from a German. So that's what we did. And uh, Did you fire weapons before? Did you know how to fire weapons before that? Well, I had, I had a six-shooter when we lived in, in, in Coven, a little a gun, which I don't know, probably one of our neighbors, and I was practicing shooting, you know, with, uh, at targets. So finally we ambushed, two of us ambushed the German, knocked him out, we didn't kill him, just Not hit him, really no. beat him up. What? Uh, beat him up and took a couple of guns that he had, he had a, a machine gun, so we just took it away. And because my perfect Lithuanian, Russian, and German, without an accent, they made me go into the city and get some information. So of course I took my yellow star off and I walked around and then I walked in to the place where we used to live, they had a Polish, uh, uh, let's see, he was a, uh, not a gardener, but kind of a gate, a keeper of the, uh, he was, he was there, a Polish family. And they were very sympathetic because I took a chance and I, I, I would, because I was friendly with both of her sons, but my age, and uh, they, I talked to them and they said, well, yeah, they can help me. They can get information and I can go there and pick it up, and it, which wasn't that much, I mean, but I used to go and gather information and bring it back to the, uh, to the underground. Now, where we were, the underground, we, we were not like on Schindler's, not Schindler, the uh, Defiance, they lived on top, I mean, all, they have the, uh, we lived underground. We had, the, the Russians had dug out things and, and we lived underground. So uh, if Germans moved around, they wouldn't see anything. And uh, 
finally, after I got most of the information, I said, you know, I'd like to go fight. So I, we used to go out and blow up trains, and <laughs> munition trains, because we used to get the information from the uh, listening to the German radios and the R Russians and so forth. And then, and this was going on for about three, three or more years. And uh, one day we were supposed to blow up a big munition train. It was going to the front. So I went with. Did you know where it was going? It was going to the to the front for the Germans. Yeah, a German. So I went with five guys, friends of ours, and we got there early. Very early it was in the middle of January, you know, and it was cold, cold and snowing because that's a cold area, and so and we got there early. It was still dark, and we took some dynamite and we laid it out under the snow, you know, and put the snow on, on the tracks, and uh, of course. The train came, and we were hiding in it, but the train came, and it blew up the train, and there were like so German soldiers in a back wagon, a back car. Uh, uh, so, and so we had a shootout with them, and uh, five, my five guys, all were wounded, some died, and they lay in there, and I was wounded, and one of the soldiers survived the German soldiers, and he was walking around with a bayonet and seeing who is still alive. I mean, because some of the guys were still alive, he used to even say, they're still alive, and then if they were still alive, he just stuck the bayonet right in there. And uh, so I was the last, it came to me, the last one, and I said, hey, this is not good. So I, my rifle, I th was like four or five feet, and I, I was wounded because I had like four bullets or five bullet holes in me. Some, some went inside and some went out. And uh, I saw him come to me, so I took my revolver and just emptied it before he even got a chance. It was about three or four feet away from me, and he killed him. And I looked at all my friends and were all dead. So I crawled back to the underground compound, and I lost a lot of blood. And the guy who was the medic over there couldn't, couldn't do anything for me. Nobody, you know, had, they had to give me a transfusion. So they decided to take me back to the ghetto hospital. They took me back to the ghetto hospital and they, I got a transfusion from some of my Jewish friends who still live in the ghetto. And then about three months later, they started to evacuate all the Jews from the ghetto and send them to a concentration camp. So I got in contact, or actually I was contacted by some of my friends from the underground who were still in the ghetto, and we found some empty houses. There's one house that we found had a one of those, those oxygen tanks, so we went in there, and because Jews, I'll, I'll backtrack, Jews were building underground things, you know, under the yard and so forth, for hide, hide, to hide. So we found one of those, and it was about six or seven or eight of us, and we had, at night, we used to go out and gather food, from, because most of the Jews were already being uh, moved to a settling, to a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a area where they were waiting to be transferred until all the Jews were there. And we were there for about six night, six days and six nights. And uh, we used to go out, we, we were, heard shootings and screaming. And so one morning we were there, we just woke up and we hear somebody's banging on the thing. Harouse, harouse, which means get out, out. And then a dog started barking and they found the trap door, and the, the seven of us went out, and we had to kneel with our hands behind our back. Of course, we left all our ammunition in the, under, in the bunker. And uh, then they gathered us, and they were taking us to the assembly place, where all the Jews were assembled. Now, the guy that was... Uh, with us, who was walking us, was not an SS. So we said, how did you find us? 
How, how, yeah. He said, well, the SS are very devious. They took some women who had babies and they took the babies away. And they said, anybody who finds those underground things, you'll get the babies back. They never gave the babies back and, you know, they lied. And so we came to the, the uh, point of assembly and we were loaded on trains and we were moved to a place called Stutthof, which was a concentration camp, men and women. And over there, what they did, they took the children and the women separate and the older kids and the men were sent to Dachau. And I was 11 months in Dachau. We slept in a kind of a, a they made an A-frame thing and underneath the dugout thing. And there were like 50 guys sleeping on one side and 50 guys on the other side. I used to wake up in the morning and two guys dead on this side, dead on the other side, you know, and it was very bad because the food, pardon me? My dad was with me, that's right, that was fortunate. And uh, pardon me, my brother was with my mother, and then my the children were sent to Auschwitz, and the women were sent to a, a women's concentration camp for that to work for Germans. You know. So my brother was sent to Auschwitz, like because he was like three years younger than me. And you were about what, seventeen or? 16? I was about the seventeen, actually sixteen, almost seventeen. Yeah. And uh, no, I was almost 18. Yeah. So, I mean, Dhaka was, was pretty bad. And then uh, we used to get up in the morning, all we had is those striped pajamas, stand there and be counted. And it was like 5.30 in the morning, it was cold and freezing. And you, know, you gave you a piece of bread and some uh, water, in essence. Yeah, and let me ask you about the food. The food, well, when we, used to, when we came back from work, which was like five or six o'clock, they gave us some broth, with potatoes, you know, but there's nothing nutritious. Uh, but see, when we used to go to work, we could pick up some from the, from the Lithuanian uh, people who lived in the city, you pick up, because we used to, we worked on the airport, in the, the, the Kovno airport, I mean, that's, they had, and that's where we worked, and we, it was a lot of other people. So we get, we get we bartered, you know, we gave them something. And, and of course, they used to check at the gate to see whether people are bringing in any kind of munition. But sometimes they took away the food, and sometimes they let, let it go. So uh, that was the... the uh, you got pneumonia? Pardon me? You got pneumonia? Oh, I had pneumonia. I was in a... Oh. Uh, uh, and if it weren't for my dad, I would have died because he 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 was with me. He went to the say, to the sick, and I they. But see, they didn't tell the doctors that I had pneumonia. I mean, because there were also some Jewish doctors that, with the prisoners who were doctors and they were helping out there. So they're the ones who told me I had pneumonia, but they don't tell the Germans <coughs> because they'd kill you. So my dad was with me, and uh, <coughs> uh, I was there for two weeks, three weeks, and finally I got out, I recuperated a little bit, and uh, about a month later, they were, the Americans were coming closer, so they took a bunch of the prisoners, and they was marching to a, I don't know where they were marching, we were, we were supposed to march, but we marched for night and day. I mean, we used to lay down a little bit and rest, but it was cold. It was in January, and we came to a big canyon after five or six days. And uh, father was with you at that time? my father. When you were marching to the canyon? My father was with, with me, that's right, yeah. And we were in a canyon, and it was dark, and we see, so all around us were. Nazis with machine guns. So we said, that's going to be it. I mean, nobody cared. We, could, we were hungry, we were cold, we were tired. Uh, so we said, well, that's, that's, that's it. That's our last day. They'd wake up in the morning, 
the Germans are gone and overseas Japanese Americans. I didn't know they were Americans. I said Japanese because I'd never seen a Japanese because of the slanted eyes and so. And uh, that was the 442nd Battalion for the Denisei, the Japanese. And they General Patton. Pardon me? General Patton. Gen yeah, General Patton is under General Patton. And then uh, we came to a place and they we were all so exhausted, so they, uh, the American Red Cross took us to a place called Santo Tillian to recuperate. You weighed 98 pounds. Pardon me? You weighed 98 pounds. Oh, when I got out of the camp, I weighed 96 pounds, and uh, a lot of people, of course, were emaciated like me. And they started eating the rich food. Three, four days later, they died. But see, I thought I could take it easy. Because, because, yeah, because I said I didn't. I was starved, you know. Don't, don't start it. So it very slowly, a little bit at a time. But anyway, so they went to a place. It's called Saint Ottilian for to recuperate, and I gained some weight over there, and I. Where was your father at that time? He was, he was with me, yeah, yeah. So I said one day as I got better, I said to my dad, well, going back to Lithuania. He said, there's nobody there. They all got killed. I mean, you know what happened. He said, well, I sent a letter to my brother in New York, and maybe we can go there. So I said, well, how about going to Palestine? I says, yeah, it's pretty rough. I said, the British are there. They don't let any Jews in. Uh, I said, we, we want to go to America. So my uncle contacted, and the Lithuanian quota was very, very slow because they considered Lithuania as an enemy country because the Lithuanians were not that uh, accommodating to the... Uh, Russians and the Germans and the I went to the Germans, but not to the Americans and so forth. But anyway, so the visa was going to take like six minimum of six years to get to, and I said, what am I going to do? Because a lot of guys started uh, dealing in the black market, and I said, well, I always wanted to be a doctor, so I said. Why don't I go to university? Then I, I realized that being a doctor, somebody told me when you go to the United States, you have to take it over again. So I said, well, I'll switch to engineering. So I went in June to the University of Munich. And I didn't pass the exam. But the guy who took my test felt kind of not sorry for me, but he, he felt kind of bad what I went through, so he says, you know, we have a retired professor who could prepare you for the fall semester. So he gave me the address, got there, I moved in with him, shared all the care packages my uncle used to send, and uh, I, after four years I got a, a degree in electronics engineering, and my visa still didn't come. So I went for a master's degree in quantum physics. Mm. So that's the very minute thing. And uh, just before I was going to get my diploma, the visa came, and I didn't want to take a chance. So I came to New York, to Brooklyn, actually, and uh, I stayed with my uncle, and it was just... Did you come alone at that time? I came alone, and two weeks later, my dad came because he remarried in in a, in a uh, DP camp, displaced persons camp. So he came two weeks later to the same, <coughs> to, New to, to New York. And I really enjoyed being with my family. You know, I had two cousins, and uh, actually three cousins, two boys and a, and a girl and my uncle and all the other f rest of the family who migrated to the United States in, uh, right after the First World War came, you know, to see me and so forth. And... Uh, I, after a while, I said, well, if I stay here, I better go get a job. So I got a job as an engineer with CBS Columbia. And that was in New York, so I had to take the rail, the uh, underground to New York, subway. every the subway every day. And uh, <coughs> while I was there, my uncle 
not my uncle, my mother's cousin, who had married, who was married to a woman who had three sisters and one brother. The three sisters, one of the three sisters migrated to the United States earlier, way before that, and she, they also had a brother. So my uncle, when he, when my, my, when his brother-in-law brought him down to, to Oakland, he kind of, my dad somehow contacted, because we, we have written while we were still in Germany with that contact. So he, he sent me a, a, a note, a letter, we were here, it's fine, this is a nice climate, and say, New York I did not like too much because it's too big. So I decided I'd go there for a visit. So my uncle said, if you are going to move to New York, if you're going to stay in New York, get involved in real estate because it makes money for you while you're asleep. <laughs> so I came, I came to California and I, I met... Your, your mother's cousin married my aunt. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a mishpacha. Yeah. Together. yeah. You, if you, no, it's I can't get both of you. I don't have to get uh, So anyway, so uh, I started an electronic business and I was there for about two years or so to, uh, with the partner. And the partner brought one of his friends and wanted to buy me out. Morris, he left out a big part. We were married by then and we had one child. I think you should sit together. No, it's okay. Honestly, that's the thing I like. No. Both of them. It's okay. Really so anyway, it was because I like to get husband and wife together. Because when when I got to, to California, I met Janet the first day I came, there was a day after the fourth of July in nineteen forty nine. Forty nine or fifty? Forty nine. Fifty. July fourth, nineteen fifty. Yeah, July fourth, nineteen fifty, that's where I came. And uh, her sister picked me up at the airport, brought me to their house, I had dinner with them, I saw Janet, and I fell in love with her. Love at first sight. Yeah, well, I mean, it was, I, I was in love, was maybe, well, I liked her, okay? And, uh, and was I, after her, and finally, after 25 years, she agreed to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, we got married in uh, 51, uh, in December of 51. In Piedmont? In... Uh, There's no... We got married in... Uh, oh, in San Francisco, actually. Mark, San yeah. Francisco. But anyway, and uh, before that, I have... was in the electronic business, and then when we were married, we had a child. My partner says, I got a friend who wants to buy me out. So he bought me out. I put the money away, and I started thinking what Uncle Irving had told me to buy real, get him out of real estate. So it took several years to to gather more money, and in '59 I built my first apartment house, and uh, then I kept on, and then I went to work for Janet's dad in a hardware business, because uh, they didn't have any appliances or TV or electronics. So I started the, the, the department, yeah. And while I was working there, I also got involved with the builder and we developed a lot of apartments. So uh, that's, that's it. Good story. But you have three children. We have three, well, yeah, we have three daughters. We have six grandchildren. Three great grandchildren. I, I, told, I told the other guy that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have, anyway, we have three, three, three daughters, uh, Kathy, Shelley, and Claudia. Kathy handles some real estate management. Uh, Shelley is an attorney, and Claudia is the president of the Jewish Federation in the East Bay. And uh, they're all married, uh, nice, and they, we have six grandchildren, and we have three Great grandchildren and one and away, wow. so uh, yeah, have a happy family. Yeah, and we're we're happy that you came to take my picture, my story. <laughs>